excited to welcome you today to our um, managing and leveraging social media in the workplace. So we have Jo Marie Dowling, who is founder and member of Dowling Law and a former member of in-house counsel at the RF. Tom Parpolarski from Binghamton University. Melissa Nicosia from Oneonta. And I'm Kathy Baker from SUNY New Paltz. So um, we've decided to do this presentation on social media kind of because we're all, we're all kind of involved in HR and we were talking about social media is a big area in our world today. It's an area that's grown exponentially in the last few years. So um, our goal today is to um, take a look at how people are using social media in the workplace, um, offer some best practices, look at some strategies, and um, hear what you have to say, what you're doing in your workplace. So we're going to start with a quick video uh, off YouTube.
Thanks. But um, so these are just you know some background about social media. It's new territory for employers and employees. A little bit of the presentation has kind of got an HR bent because that's where we are. Um, but you know, how do people use social media in the workplace? Um, how do you manage it? Um, how do you know that employees are using social media that um, isn't distracting or potentially harmful for your organization? So we have threw some humor in here. Um, so you know, people used to put graffiti on the walls in the bathroom. They would write with Sharpie or leave your phone number or yeah. for a good time. Now you know they check in. They let people know where they are. Nothing's a secret. Um, you know, so this is just kind of something funny. So um, social media is changing the way we communicate at home and at work. And um, I'm just gonna, I know that we just went through that video and it listed a lot of social media sites, but I'm just gonna name a few, like LinkedIn and Facebook and Google Plus, Pinterest, Tumblr, Twitter, Yelp. Um, if you're ever looking for a restaurant and you want reviews, people look on Yelp. Um, if you wanna share recipes, people look on Pinterest. Um, these applications present great opportunities for business in the areas of public relations, internal and external communications, recruiting, organizational learning, and collaboration. Um, you know, you can collaborate on internet forums, online publications, uh, podcasts, pictures, video, email, instant messaging, music sharing, um, voice over internet, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, um, and knowledge sharing takes place through a lot of processes, including discussion with questions and answers, which would be an online forum, collaborative editing, like a wiki. So Wikipedia, can anybody can edit a Wikipedia entry. Um, and um, storytelling with reactions would be a blog. So if somebody wants to tell a story, you can make a comment on their blog. So this is our up and coming audience for all of us that are at colleges. Um, these are our undergraduate students right now. Um, through some market research, um, these are this is what their favorite things to do. So Apple iPhone, coffee, texting, Facebook, iPad, Instagram, drinking beer. <laughs> um, so what are we going to do to keep these people who may become our employees, our coworkers, engaged in their jobs when this is their world. Um, you know, this was not my world growing up. Um, you know, ten, ten channels on the TV was about my world. Um, <laughs> so how do you how do you keep those people engaged? It's going to be a challenge. So we have another video. With social media sites being used by one third of the entire world, they've clearly had a major influence on society. But what about our bodies? Here are five crazy ways that social media and the internet are affecting your brain right now. Can't log off? Surprisingly, 5-10% to of internet users are actually unable to control how much time they spend online. Though it's a psychological addiction as opposed to a substance addiction, brain scans of these people actually show a similar impairment of regions that those with drug dependence have. Specifically, there's a clear degradation of white matter in the regions that control emotional processing, attention, and decision making. Because social media provides immediate rewards with very little effort required, your brain begins to rewire itself, making you desire these stimulations. And you begin to crave more of this neurological excitement after each interaction. Sounds a little like a drug, right? We also see a shift when looking at multitasking. You might think that those who use social media or constantly switch between work and websites are better at multitasking, but studies have found that when comparing heavy media users to others, they perform much worse during task switching tests. Increased multitasking online reduces your brain's ability to filter out interferences and can even make it harder for your brain to commit information to memory. Like when your phone buzzes in the middle of productive work. Or wait, did it even buzz? Phantom Vibration Syndrome is a relatively new psychological phenomenon where you think you felt your phone go off, but it didn't. 
In one study, 89% of test subjects said they experienced this at least once every two weeks. It would seem that our brains now perceive an itch as an actual vibration from our phone. As crazy as it seems, technology has begun to rewire our nervous system, and our brains are being triggered in a way they never have before in history. Social media also triggers a release of dopamine, the feel-good chemical. Using MRI scans, scientists found that the reward centers in people's brains are much more active when they're talking about their own views as opposed to listening to others. Not so surprising, we all love talking about ourselves, right? But it turns out that while 30 to 40% of face-to-face -face conversations involve communicating our own experiences, around 80% of social media communication is self-involved. The same part of your brain related to orgasms, motivation, and love are stimulated by your social media use, and even more so when you know you have an audience. Our body is physiologically rewarding us for talking about ourselves online. But it's not all so self-involved. In fact, studies on relationships have found that partners tend to like each other more if they meet for the first time online rather than with a face-to-face -face interaction. Whether it's because people are more anonymous or perhaps more clear about their future goals, there's a statistical increase in successful partnerships that started online. So while the internet has changed our verbal communication with increased physical separation, perhaps the ones that matter the most end up even closer. Now we're going to open up uh, the discussion. Tom's going to lead an open discussion. So this is a, uh, the workshop portion of, of this uh, presentation. So we just didn't want to be up here and just spew information out and show fancy clips. Uh, we really wanted to know what's going on on your campuses and your work environments. So, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of different ways that we use uh, social media, but you know, how are, how are you using it? How are you using it in the workplace? How does it apply in research? Uh, and, and this is where we want to, we want to get to. So the, this next slide uh, lists a few things about that might be obvious to you. And then I gave you a handout here of uh, framework for social media. And these are, um, these are actually snippets from this, this portion on Wikipedia. But you know, we use uh, social media for identity, conversations, for sharing, uh, for presence, relationships, reputation, and groups. And uh, are, are there any instances that you can share on your campus uh, that might help us as a group apply it in our, on our campuses? Do you use social media at all in your workplace for work? We use it uh, particularly for sharing information on our annual student research symposium with the students. So our student symposium is called Great Day, so Great Day has a Facebook account, it also has a Twitter feed, um, so students can like it or follow the feed um, to get regular updates about submission processes, news, like who, who the keynote speaker is going to be, things like that. Um, that's one of the ways we use it. And which campus is that? Geneseo. Geneseo. Thank you. Yes? At Stony Brook, we have um, an internal social media product called Yammer. Um, and it's kind of like Facebook, but only people from Stony Brook can log into it. Um, at first, I was pretty skeptical because of you know rewiring your brain and making a zombie and all that. Um, but I've actually found that it's useful for collaborating on projects. I know a lot of times, by email, you get one person replies, and another person replies, and you get this reply chain that no one can ever follow. And I find that Yammer is better for those sorts of conversations. Um, it's not necessarily good for sharing documents that can do that, um, but that's one tool that I found. Um, I had a question for everybody also, if that's... I just want to clarify, okay. what campus were you from? Stony Brook University. And you said uh, Yammer? Yammer. 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 Have people right. heard of Yammer? Yeah. No, okay. It's, it's kind of like Facebook. Yeah, it's kind yeah. of like Facebook. Um, but you can invite security. people to join a group right. um, and keep it limited to that group. Right. Um, the definition of Yammer in the dictionary is to kind of blather on mindlessly, which is funny. <laughs> 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 you said you had a question also. Yeah, so... Um, for outward-facing social media, I was curious to know what other campuses were doing, um, and specifically in the research office, and how you coordinate with your your communications office on campus, how you coordinate with RF Central, because um, there are a lot of entities that all might be tweeting or putting on Facebook the same things. 
and maybe slightly contradicting each other and we're trying to figure out what we should post and to where. So I don't know if other campuses have you know, solved that problem. So right? I'll tell you a little bit about uh, New Pulse has a social media hub okay. that's managed by our uh, communications and marketing department. Okay. And um, I just kind of introduced myself to this a few weeks ago. I went to a workshop and I didn't know we had a social media hub. And it's right there on our on our webpage. Mm -hmm. I just had to scroll down just a little <laughs> bit further than I normally do. Students use it all the time. They do exactly what you were just saying. You know, they talk about a topic. Mm -hmm. They're not emailing one person and then back to another. Um, and we do nothing from our sponsored programs office with it okay. yet. So we're, you know, I feel like we're in our infancy stage finding out about how we can use social media for recruitment and for mm -hmm. thing. But, at, you know, I, I look at some of those things that it says in the video and I think about um, that statistic about relationships, mm -hmm. relationships online lasting longer. Well, to me, it doesn't matter what the relationship is, but if there's a higher percentage of making right. a relationship last longer, that's a door that we should open. Right, and I know our campus uses it for this stuff. I was talking specifically in the context of research. That's, I, I don't know what the answer is there, so that's yeah. why I was asking the group, since we all do research here. Mm -hmm. Genesee right now sends announcements about awards to college communications, okay. and then they, in turn, will post them on social media. Um, so we don't want to duplicate effort. So that's been sort of the chain of information. Mm -hmm. They're actually understaffed right now because they had some folks leave. So we could theoretically take it over. But they like to make right. sure everything meets their standards before they. Right. So is that tweeted from the Geneseo Twitter account, or is that from the, the research account? Uh, I'm not on Twitter, I have to admit. But Facebook. Okay. Their Facebook page right. uh, announcements about our grants will show up in my own Facebook feed okay, but that's from SUNY Geneseo. Okay, not from yeah. SUNY Geneseo's research office. No. Okay. No. Yeah, we're the same way in Alianza. We're not allowed to have any outward communications that haven't been vetted by our director of communications. So we can't even do um, campus wide emails. It has to come from has to be blessed in order for us to have any outside communications. Other uh, experiences using social media? I'll talk about Binghamton for a minute. So uh, our director of student services, they run the TRIO programs. So they are using, uh, they are using Facebook to connect our students with research opportunities because there's a big push for undergrads to introduce them to research early. So they're doing that uh, using Facebook. I also asked her if she recognized any changing trends. And this is uh, Marty Wigman's, uh, if, if anybody knows Marty. And she said that uh, the younger generation is changing. They're more on uh, Instagram, uh, Snapchat, and Shutterfly. Uh, I'd also like to mention that my nephew this past week was in Florida, and uh, he was on spring break. And he posted pictures on Facebook just so his grandmother could see them. So <laughs> is that a trend? Yes. So the advice I'm going to give you is to know your, know your, um, know your audience. Uh, I might suggest before you choose a platform to introduce social media into your business is do a business needs analysis. I mean, some of these same rules just apply. Do a business needs analysis so that you can do, uh, remember the old uh, who, what, when, where, why, and how of a newspaper reporter? Or if you're using social media, you're out there. You're, you're, you're releasing information, and a lot of it's public. So, you know, uh, know your who, what, when, where, why, and how. We have the next slide, please. The, oh, it's already there. Thank yeah. you. So... That was some of them uh, that I wanted to get to uh, business needs. You know, I wanted to mention, without reading through these, uh, I, I did mention know your audience or, or discover your audience. Uh, you know, I think the way uh, Twitter and texting 
all these things have changed. Think about email in the earlier days. People were just running uh, messages and they were kind of, you had to interpret them. And then remember early text, we had the acronyms and we had all these, these we had to figure it all out. Now we have autofill. So, you know, one of the things that we have to be aware of is if it's out there. So, you know, whatever we put out there, either as a user or, or a receiver of the message, it, it really has to be treated as a formal message. Uh, productivity. We started off with this um, presentation. We were going to discuss productivity and, and um, progressive discipline. And we found that there was so much more to talk about. But I'll tell you how I handle uh, productivity in my office. Uh, Donna's one of my staffers, and we ha I have a staff of four. And, you know, people are on their phones all the time. People are on their screens looking at things all the time. I am not the police, okay? What I'm expecting is people to be productive. My staff is very productive. Uh, I am not monitoring uh, their daily social media use. I'm monitoring uh, their end results. And it's not a matter of just delivering results. What I'm interested to are people stretching their goals. Are people stretching their objectives? Are they just saying, okay, that's done? So I'm, I'm looking for my employees to really be more than just what the job description defines. And the next slide, please. So these are more comedy, okay? Uh, he had over 2,000 Facebook friends. I was expecting a, a bigger turnout. I want to flip it. My son said, I've got so many friends that his, his uh, his formula for deleting people are, if they wish me happy birthday on Facebook, and I don't know who they are, I delete them. <laughs> and then Batman and Robin really speaks for itself. The location of our back cave is meant to be secret, so stop checking it. <laughs> anyway, I'd like to hand it over to Joe Marie. Thank you. I appreciate it. So there's something about social media that just requires disclosure, right? That's what we do on social media. So I wanted to start off with my own personal disclosure. And that is that I have three minor celebrities as Facebook friends. A person who, is, she's an actress, she was in the uh, most recent Liam Neeson uh, movie with speaking role, <laughs> speaking role a former contestant on Survivor, and the third person was the uh, ugly second head in the uh, Mike's Hard Lemonade uh, campaign that happened a few years ago. <laughs> so those are my three minor celebrity friends. And the reason I'm, I, well, so, so I think probably what you're asking yourself is, is this relevant to our conversation? <laughs> Or are you just trying to impress us with your Hollywood connections? And the answer is both. I'm trying to do both. The reason why I actually thought this might be interesting is because our social media issues tend to present when we have this sometimes uncomfortable uh, connection between or, or uh, blurring between our, our private lives and our professional lives. And that's often where, like, probably. And speaking for the HR people in the room, maybe 90% of our social media issues. So I wanted just to talk about some of these. Um, you know, the, the social media issues with disclosure um, often center around disclosure of the organization's information, employee information, uh, client or customer uh, real information, um, or student information. And obviously, one of the concerns that we have is whether there's information that's being disclosed that, that needs to be kept confidential for legal reasons, like under FERPA or under HIPAA with, with student or, or client inf or patient information. So we certainly have those concerns. And we also, as an organization, have concerns about keeping proprietary information confidential. On the other hand, not every disclosure even when it's an uncomfortable disclosure, not, not all of that is unlawful, and in some cases can be protected uh, activity. And so we have to be careful about balancing a number of different considerations. 
The problem um, is that social media obviously has come a long way in, in, uh, in a very short period of time. And as social media is evolving, um, so is the law. Um, and so we're constantly having statutes that were written you know, sometimes 80 years ago, and we're, we're interpreting them now uh, when they had clearly no idea that Snapchat uh, was going to be around when they, when they wrote these laws. So we, in this presentation, aren't really going to talk uh, a lot about the hard and fast rules um, associated with how the law is applying in the, in the case of social media, but instead wanted to, to identify a few places um, so where we can, can manage social media, particularly, uh, I'll say my bent is in the context of, of HR uh, because I'm a labor and employment attorney, but we have some other um, situations as well. So <clears throat> the first one is with respect to uh, the RF social media policy. And the RF does have a social media policy. It's available on the website. And a couple of points that I wanted to make. First of all, the social media policy requires that individuals be authorized before they create or maintain an, an RF presence um, in any social media form, or if they attempt to speak or represent themselves as, a, as a, an authorized spokesperson of the RF. Uh, so like your campuses that want to manage some of the information that's going public, uh, so, so does the RF corporate. Um, it also discusses how the RF is going to handle when there's a social media issue related to uh, discriminating or harassing kinds of behaviors or other um, communications that would violate either RF policy, uh, campus policy, or, or the law. Um, so if you have an official RF presence um, that one of your programs is working on, it's a, it's a great tool, but certainly be communicating on the campus and, and with your um, local communications folks, but, but also probably want to make sure that we're dialoguing with external relations and corporate communications that can, can help authorize and make sure that that's, that um, communication is in, uh, in compliance with the social media policy. The second piece is actually one with respect to ownership, or what do we do when we're creating social media, or we have data that's being stored in social media policy. So we talk about blogs. For example, if you have a, a blog uh, related to a specific program, um, who owns that? Um, and, and does everybody understand who owns that before um, things go bad? Um, if you have an individual you've hired uh, to help a particular program develop community relationships, for example, um, where is the information about those connections stored? If most of the information is stored on the individual employee's LinkedIn account, what happens when that person leaves? You've got all this data for the program, but it's not actually accessible to you. So be thinking about those issues at the onset of an employment relationship or at the onset of a, a new foray into social media can really save you a lot of heartache at the end. Um, the, the next points, three and four, um, are, are sort of in tandem. Um, there are specific requirements, both on federal and state, um, in the federal and state law, uh, related to investigations of employees using social media um, or taking action against someone because of social media. We want to make sure that we hit those points, you know, that we understand what the requirements are at the very beginning of an investigation or as we become aware that social media is implicated. Because we just want to make sure that we're doing things the right way. If we don't do things the right way, we could have an issue in terms of how we're able to use that information. And certainly there's, there are some serious issues, particularly with like violations of federal law like HIPAA and FERPA. Um, so we want to make sure that we understand those off the bat. So if you're involved in an investigation, the first step would really be your local HR office, typically. Um, and so I would think that they would be a good place to start. And then they can consult with corporate HR um, or with the Office of General Counsel for more specific advice, because as I said, the legal requirements for this continue to change. So we want to make sure that we're doing things the right way 
and that we get the right information to the right people. So um, the last point actually sort of dovetails uh, with what Tom was saying in terms of social media and its effect on performance. You know, before we all had these mini computers on our phones, um, people had to use the old-fashioned way. They'd had to waste time on their, on their work computers because that's what they had available to them, and we could monitor that. And so we got in, you know, probably, I would say 15 or so years ago or more, we would be monitoring people, you know, if we felt like they were abusing their time, um, you know, on, on their computer. And when we got to the point where people were using their phones or their iPads or, or other tablets, or those sorts of things, um, I think we had kind of a bit of an identity crisis. So we're like, we can't monitor that the way that we can um, a, a campus computer. <coughs> and I think it was actually a really good transition for us because it brought us back, because we got distracted with what it was that people were doing and we forgot what we were really concerned about. It doesn't matter whether somebody's wasting their time on Instagram or meditation or crossword puzzles. The issue really is the work. And so helping as a supervisor to be specific really about what our expectations are or to if we're working with supervisors to help them focus on what it is that we really expect from um, from our employees in terms of their performance and their deliverables. That's really, I think, where we've, we've refocused our efforts um, to be very clear about our communications at the onset, um, to make sure that our expectations are not only clearly um, delivered, but also that we follow up on them, that we're actively managing um, the process, that we have that dialogue with employees. We're putting more focus on that, and that's quite honestly where we really should be as managers. So I think it's a really good development for us, but one that we really need to be talking amongst ourselves to make sure that we're doing on a regular basis, um, because that's that's ultimately it's more work, but in the in the end, it's a it's a much better process and it's much easier for me to defend than if we got caught up in the social media and had rules like you can't bring your phone, cell phone into work, you have to keep it in the car. Um, that's an easy rule, but it's an insane rule. Um, so again, keeping the, perf you know, the performance expectations clear um, and, um, and well documented is, a, is really a good practice. I think with that, we're ready to open it up to questions or, or additional comments. <laughs> so I'm sitting here thinking, if we have an employee that's gone rogue and they've used their private uh, social media site to make derogatory statements against the RF, we have access uh, to that through the grapevine, but we can, we, can, we can legitimately document that we need to do something about it. Well, let's say it's on LinkedIn. Um, <laughs> What would be the first? Uh, what would be the protocol? Would we do, would we call Peter uh, Talkin, or would we um, who, who who would we pass that up to in that case? I'm sorry. Let me make sure that I understand the question. That this is an individual who has set up their own RF account or an account in the RF name. I would say uh, no, they would have an account in their name, they'd have a personal account, but they were making derogatory statements against the organization, and, and they were public, right. but yet it's a private account. What would be our protocol to, to disable that, right. those statements? So the first step would be, Tom, that you would reach out to your local HR person, would be okay. the first step, um, and then that person which would be Tom in this case, um, would, would likely then be, be looking for support um, from corporate employee relations and from the Office of General Counsel. Um, and probably your local communications folks as well as corporate uh, employee relations, or excuse me, corporate um, uh, communications um, to be looking at this 
with essentially the, the latest guidance in terms of what kinds of comments are protected uh, versus those that are unprotected, um, as well as what kind of communications um, strategy we need um, to, to address those comments publicly if we need to. Um, so it really has to be a very holistic approach and thinking about all the different people who need to be at the table. Brings me to a different place. You, you have a presentation that talks about the potential and assets that are available in social media. And then partway through the presentation, it's, but you can't do it the way that it's designed to happen because it has to go through this entire mechanism of filtering and the rest of it. And I understand that. I think it, it makes tons of, of logical sense. And then, and here are all of the really negative ways that it can be used and it can come around and bite us in very unpleasant places. So, Having worked with a lot of very young people, like those those folks who are so far out there working in that whole situation, if you want to capture their attention and pull them in, I think that you're, the conundrum is that you have to be able to do that really, really fast and really, really engaging ways, and you're, the entire system is set up not to make that happen. So I don't know how to effectively use this to support really wonderful research efforts unless it's on individual LinkedIn pages or faculty pages or student pages that don't say RF and don't say individual university names but start to talk about these wonderful ideas that are happening or within systems that are happening at specific campuses that are already maintained. It's really tricky though. Because you're not going to get out to the community very effectively. I agree. It's very way. tricky and it's and it's the population that's coming our way is embedded in, in social media. They use it for everything. So we're the dinosaur in the room, and how are we going to bring ourselves, bring them into our, or us into their world? So well, the, the legal system is equally behind the curve with the whole thing. So um, I'm a tiny little person at the School of Nursing at the University of Buffalo. So I'm a staff person in the School of Nursing. I end up doing a lot of support things. We have publications that go out that talk about different things that are happening, but without permission and signed permissions, photographs can't go and shouldn't go out to different publications. And that's just one tiny little example. Uh, if you've got kids who are doing things that they're so excited about, they're, they're doing nursing interventions in, in South America and very much want to be able to put that together. But unless they're using their personal spaces to do that, if it's going through the university, it's going to go slow. Um, Gary, if you want to address that. Great, great, uh, great comment. It, it, it's, you know what, it's after 5 o'clock and you got me thinking. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you know, in our, in our, in our fields, um, we have for, for, uh, for human subjects, research is just an example that over the years there has been a mechanism established to do expedited review because of the imperatives of a health issue that a subject was having and somehow this apparatus responded to that so that they could do something a little faster and I wonder if the same thing is true with uh, social, social media. The other thing is back to Tom's comment a bit I thought, you know what, if all we were working with these days in 2015 were good old pens, the, 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 the good taste, the, the, the thoughts about community norms, the thoughts about how to express oneself with a pen, no different than it would be with social media. And I'm, I'm speaking as a, a dinosaur, but with, with two dinosaur eggs that are now in their mid-20s. Mid <laughs> and, and they and they got the same sense of this. They they get offended when they see things in, in social media that would be against good taste or offensive to others and things. So I have a lot of confidence in our ability to actually do this. And I think what you've given us is a challenge actually to do it right. And, and uh, I hope we can rise to that. I've got a question for you, then. Um, so part of social media, there, when I first started out, it was people communicating with other people. Now 
companies like Facebook are taking advertising opportunities. You go on your Facebook account, now there's placed ads in there. So is the RF looking at you know, jumping up into that sort of realm, um, adding sort of not just advertising, but sort of uh, um, yeah, newsy type items and, and sort of on the slide putting putting thoughts into you know into the social media stream that may, may not necessarily look like advertising, but those opportunities are there. Well, when we have a Facebook page and uh, uh, yours truly actually posted something that that someone else understood how to put on to, uh, to Twitter. I actually took a picture of something and it ended up in a something for us. I don't know whether it was, it was Twitter or video or God knows what it may have been. But um, it's, it's, uh, it is an opportunity for us. It's just we use thought, it. and we get, something we get, new, yeah. We, get, we get, uh, get feedback on our Facebook page. I've seen some of the comments. Couple of them from my uh, my neighbors, you know, that may see a photograph of something. But there may be people in other parts of our our industry, potential sponsors and uh, and collaborators that would be very interested in these things. So, good good question. I just want to make a comment. I'm on the institutional review board, and the students um, use social media. Mm -hmm. um, I can see if they have a link to Qualtrics. Of course, that's going to be the anonymity. But they're asking questions and maybe very personal. Um, we had a student submit um, that um, it was about their sexual preferences <laughs> and the confidentiality and the immunity. We have to, as an IRB, make sure that the participants are protected because they're just so used to chatting back and forth that it's right, a concern. Right, but those protections are built into the institutional review documents that they yes. have to see how they're going to yeah. store their data. Yes. Because yes. I, yes. I do. Very they see the don't IRB. see the importance of it. Some of these students are like, oh, I never thought about that. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> and that's why, so and so that's where you can educate them. Yes, and that's what we use in our workshops. We've added slides for that, too, right. because um, it is a concern. And like I said, some of the students don't see that it's an issue and until it's really brought to their attention. So sometimes it could be a challenge. And then we have to make sure that they're being honest <laughs> because they just want to get the research done because they need to graduate. And you know what I mean? So it's, it's, you know, sometimes it could be a challenge. I think you raised a really good point about um, the inability to be able to promote the activities that might be happening in your sponsored programs office um, on a campus level. Um, the Research Foundation is different. Um, that's a second level for us, but on the campus level, you know, everything, like I had said, had to be vetted. So I think that it does kind of tie your hands. Um, you want to be able to promote the activities of your students. And there are ways that can be done um, if you work with your communications department. I mean, we have our student research day, and that information gets put out on the Facebook page. The college tweets about it. So it's there if you can be a strong enough advocate to get the information out there. I think um, the ability is there. You just have to really want to do it. this a couple of things. One, um, one of the things I first did when I joined the RF, and this has been within the last year, often, sorry, I gotta speak up like, <laughs> um, was I probably uh, associated myself to my LinkedIn account with the RF. That was something that I just uh, did by choice and was very proud to do. Um, that being said, what, and I'm listening to the conversation that's taking place and part of it's around the HR and part of it's about larger issues. I think that um, I think there's a real opportunity um, <clears throat> in terms of looking at the next the next generation of researchers, the next level uh, generation of research administrators, the next generation of school administrators 
And I think those, these are issues that, that you're raising that have to be thought out at all three levels in terms of how we're going to approach promoting um, each of the activities of the individual researchers and the institution and the archive. It's definitely an open an open conversation. It's not something you know we can't uh, get taken taken care of in a day or a week. It's and you have to have uh, a team collaboration. You know your marketing, your communication, and marketing. I know on our campus they go to a lot of departments and they set up web pages and Facebook pages for those individual departments, but not everybody's there yet. Mm. I think that Peter's question brings a whole other level again. And that's if there are Facebook pages and LinkedIn accounts and there's advertising running along the side of it, is there then an obligation to be vigilant about those associations? And how complicated does that make things? And it's not just the advertising, too. There are bloggers out there who have huge followings. So a mention in a blog that would cast uh, the Research Foundation in a good light could be worth a lot more than a lot of dollars that you would spend on trying to advertise on Facebook. That's true. So it's, it's individuals now have this great power that they didn't have before. You know, other than standing in the t uh, town square and mm -hmm. shouting out, you know, yeah. now it's a global audience. But I can also see that there would be certain corporate entities that would also, whether they did it overtly, so it was themselves posting ads, Absolutely. or they would do it covertly and hire those bloggers to do mentions and skewing things. And I think that from a researcher's standpoint, that, that becomes incredibly complicated. I'll just put it there. It also raises potentially some legal issues, depending yeah. on how it's done and, and what the relationship between the parties are. So you said, someone had said earlier about sending emails back and forth and how you end up having like this really long stream and you don't know who answered who. So we used um, Google Docs to right. do this presentation, yep. and we could all be on it at the same time, touching the document. Mm -hmm. to, and so it's live, and it was, you know, I mean, I feel like I'm fairly savvy with certain things, but this was like something new for me. So there's a lot of really good collaborative things out there. Yes, sir. So we use, at Stony Brook, we use Google everything on the academic <laughs> side. But on the hospital side, they can't use Google, or they think they can't because of HIPAA reasons. So if you're using Google Docs for your work, um, verify with uh, the lawyers or whomever that you're allowed to use it because of HIPAA. Um, and I guess it depends what kind of documents you're sharing. Right. Because you know, if, if it's your agenda. Stored right. On an it's there. your website. Right. Right. Yeah. right. It's in the cloud. Right, and there are you know, laws about where the server's allowed to be, right. and I'm sure Google will claim that they're HIPAA compliant if you pay them this much money, but I don't know how much <laughs> this much money is. That's a really good point. Anything else? Thank you all so much for coming today. We really Thank you very much.